Hey Northwest, we're here on the south lawn of our campus at our new outdoor services and we're excited to be meeting in person again. I want to invite you to come join us. We meet for two services, our worship center service at 8 a.m. and our live and loud service at 10 a.m. We have a large stage set up under a huge tent with a speaker system to give you a great listening experience. And we have plenty of chairs for you and your family while still having room for six feet of spacing. Alongside our adult services, we have two children's ministry services happening at the same times of 8 and 10 a.m meeting outside in the center courtyard. Check-in is at the south gate. As a church, we believe it is so important for us to come together as one body and worship the Lord together, and we really encourage you to come join us in person on Sundays. However, we will still be offering this online service each week, and we are glad that you are joining us today. Now, let's get ready to worship. Welcome to Northwest Church. I want to say thank you for joining us right now. We are going to sing about the impossible things that God can do in each and every one of our lives because he is truly an unstoppable God.
treasures to the sky.
Good morning again, everyone. My name is Jared Carl. I'm a student ministries pastor here. We're so glad you joined us this morning. If this is your first time attending Northwest Church, we'd love to hear from you. Text WELCOME to 559-435-2200. We'd love to connect with you and give you a free gift, which is our way of saying thanks for joining us. For those of you who want to come worship with us in person on Sundays, we are now meeting on our south lawn under a huge tent. Our worship center service is at 8 a.m. and our live and loud service is at 10 a.m. Our children's ministry is also meeting outside in the center courtyard for two-year-olds through sixth grade. For more information about these outdoor services, visit nwc.org. We will continue to provide an online worship service as well as online kids service. And we're thankful that we can worship together here at church and with you at home. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube so you can have easy access to all our online content. We also have several resources for you to check out on our streaming page at nwc.org, such as sermon notes and children's ministry videos. These resources will help your whole family have an amazing experience with God. On our website, you'll also find our digital connection card. We want to hear from you. Fill that out to let us know how God is moving in your life or tell us about prayer requests that you have. It has never been more important to lift one another in prayer. And I want to encourage you to share your prayer requests with us this morning and throughout the week. If you'd like to pray with a pastor, call the church office or text prayer to 559-435-2200. We have pastors standing by who would love to pray with you right now. Last but not least is giving. At Northwest Church, we believe that giving is a spiritual gift and an act of worship. You can give to our church today through an online giving at nwc.org or by mailing your check to our church office at 5415 Northwest Avenue. When you give to Northwest Church, every penny goes to advancing God's kingdom here in Fresno and all throughout the world. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this morning and our ability to, to be together. Um, God, either with friends or family in our homes. And God, we just pray for the service. God, that you would move. Um, God, that your truth would sink deep into our hearts. God, that you'd be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear today's message from Pastor Will. Well, good morning. Great to see you guys at Northwest Church. Have you ever tried to smile for a long time, like an uncomfortably long period of time? If you tried to smile throughout this whole message, it'd be pretty painful. Did you know there's a Guinness Book of World Records for smiling? Uh, one lady named Lisa Lester, she smiled for 10 hours and five minutes. That just sounds horrible, doesn't it? No one wants to smile that long. Today, I want to talk to you about joy that goes far beyond smiling. You see, smiling is outward, but joy is inward. It exudes out. Joy is internal. It's an inside job. Now, we're constantly seeking happiness. We want to be happy. Bobby McFerrin wrote a song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And we all want to be happy. Even restaurants uh, lure you in with the promise of happy hour. If you come here during this time, you're going to save money and you will be happy. But there's a difference between happiness and joy. Let me show you what this difference is. The difference between happiness and joy is massive. Happiness depends on what happens. And when what happens seems good to you, well, you say, I'm happy. But when what happens seems bad to you, you say, I'm unhappy. If you are trusting in your circumstances to bring you joy, and the happiness will come from good circumstances, but if you're trusting in that for joy, you're going to always be a victim of your circumstances. Because circumstances always change. People change. Possessions change. Places change. Situations change. Happiness is sort of like a person who puts on cosmetics. It makes your face sort of look better. But joy is the character on the inside of you. Happiness meets the surface needs of your life, but joy meets the internal needs of your life. Happiness is more like a thermometer. It tells the temperature of what's going on around you, but joy is more like a thermostat that changes the conditions around you. Happiness will evaporate anytime you go through suffering. However, joy 
intensifies when you go through suffering. There's a song that we used to sing when we were kids, and maybe you recall, I'm in right, out right, upright, down right, happy all the time. The truth is, that's a lie. Nobody can be happy all the time. However, you can have joy all the time. And you can also lose your joy. Two verses about this in the Bible. In Psalm 51, the Bible tells us this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. What does that mean? That means you lost the joy of your salvation. That's possible. And David, through sin in his life, lost the joy of his salvation. He says, uphold me with a willing spirit and then I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. He wanted other people to get their joy back also. And then the book of Nehemiah says this about joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you don't have strength today, it might be because your strength is not being renewed with joy. Joy is what lifts the burdens. It lifts the weariness. Joy energizes your physical and your spiritual life. Today, I want to show you a lady that Jesus met and talked to. Jesus met all kinds of people. He met common people. In fact, the Bible says the common people heard him gladly. He met people on the end of the spectrum that were demon-possessed. He met politicians, like in the case of Nicodemus. But today, I want to show you a meeting that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman. And this meeting was so impactful on her life that she would leave the meeting, leave her water pots, and tell everyone of what Jesus had done for her because she had such great joy. Here's the bottom line today. The bottom line is this. Jesus alone can give you joy. If you're looking anywhere else for joy, you're never going to find it. In fact, you're going to be frustrated with every ounce of your being until you look to Jesus. And today I want to share with you sort of a three-step journey that everyone takes in order to get to joy. The first step begins with an encounter with Jesus. Let's read together in John chapter 4 and verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although, as I said this last week, Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, the Bible says that Jesus had to go away and go through Samaria. There were really two reasons for that. Number one, the first one is John's ministry was being threatened by Jesus' ministry. This was becoming a bone of contention, not with him and John, but with unbelievers. They were saying, see, your baptism's no good. And Jesus just thought, you know what? It's better to let John do his work here and me go somewhere else. The second reason he had to go through Samaria was because there was a Samaritan woman that he had a divine appointment with. And you know what? God has some divine appointments in your life and you will make every single one of them. The question is, what decision will you make during that divine encounter with God? Now, a lot of good Jews would not have gone the route that Jesus went. This is the route that Jesus took. Jesus was down here in the region of Judea and he had to go to Galilee. So he went directly through Sychar. That's the most direct route to go. A lot of Jews would go way around and say, you know what? I don't want to be anywhere near a Samaritan. But Jesus says, you know what? I'm not going to do that. They had a lot of bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans, and it went back a long, long time. David, uh, a thousand years before, had been king, and he moved the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. And so all worship was taking place in Jerusalem. And he, did, he wanted to build a temple, but God said, no, you're not going to do that. Your son Solomon will build a temple. And Solomon built a temple there, and all worship was there for over 500 years before it was destroyed. And then later, it would be rebuilt by Herod, and it would look like this. And this is the temple that would have been there uh, when Jesus was there. But sometime after that temple was built, not long, the northern and southern kingdoms were divided. Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king, 
And Rehoboam did not listen to the old advisors. He just listened to the younger advisors. And that caused the kingdom to be split between the north and the south. Ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. And the northern kingdom said, you know, Jerusalem is not convenient for us. We're going to worship in Samaria. And that's what they did. And the other thing that happened with that northern kingdom was they would intermarry with other nations. And pretty soon they were only half Jewish and then half another nation. And they were called Samaritans. And these Samaritans had different theological beliefs. Many of them, uh, well, in fact, all of them, they did not believe anything past the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They didn't believe in the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs, any of that stuff. And so there was a big gap between these two groups. Now the text continues in verse 5 and says this. So he, Jesus, came to a, a town of Samaria called Sychar, where the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, noon and a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her give me a drink for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food so Jesus simply asked this woman for a drink now they're in the city of Sychar Sychar was a city that was essentially purchased by Jacob and then willed to his son Joseph and then Joseph, after he died, his bones were taken back there. But there was in this city a famous well. It was a well that Jacob himself had dug literally 2,000 years earlier. It was a sacred place even at that time. Today, that well still exists, and it looks something like this. This is a 4,000-year-old well, and there is still water in the well. But this was something of a, of a novelty back then. And they were you know, impressed that Jacob you know, had dug this well and it was still going, still flowing. And so Jesus stops at this well around noontime. He's tired, he's hungry, and he's hot. And he has an encounter with a woman who is three problems, really, for anyone watching this. Number one, she's a woman. Number two, she's a Samaritan woman. And that's not what the other Jews would have liked. And then third... This is a woman with a bad reputation. Now, it's important to note that she's coming there at noon. That tells us volumes about her because we know that women would go in groups. It was a social gathering and they would go early in the morning before it got hot or if they didn't do that, they would go late at night after the sunset because it was much more comfortable. This tells us that this woman was already a social outcast she had no status in that community but Jesus says I'm going to engage and we're going to talk now the fact that the disciples weren't there is really just because Jesus was a rabbi and back in that time as a respect to your teacher you would make sure they had food and lodging and they would take care of those things and they respected their teachers and so Jesus finds himself alone with this woman at the well all joy begins with an encounter with Jesus. Number two, joy is only possible when you know who God is and what he offers. If you don't know who God is and you don't know what God's offering, you're never going to find joy. But look at what happens next in this story. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman from Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, probably about a hundred feet deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. So this point is made, there's no dealings between the Samaritans and the Jews. And she's like, why are you even talking to me? Well, the truth is there was some business going on between Jews and Samaritans as evidenced by the fact that disciples were out getting food from the Samaritans to eat. There were 
some things they didn't do together, like they didn't touch the same silverware, but she wanted to focus on the 400 years of hostility that had gone on between the Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, the northern kingdom had mixed married, and they'd also mixed religions. But Jesus cuts right through all that and says this, If you knew who I was, you wouldn't want to talk about history of the Jews and the Samaritans. You would have instead asked me for the ultimate drink. Well, when she hears this, she says, But you can't get me anything to drink. You don't even have a bucket. Typically in that time, a traveler would carry around a goat skin bucket because it was something that could be crushed and then, you know, it could also be kind of reinflated a little bit. And it was lightweight. You could carry that when you come across a well, you could get some water. Jesus didn't have that. And she says, you can't give me anything. What are you going to do? And then she makes the point. What, do you actually think you're greater than Jacob? And Jesus kind of <laughs> must be thinking, well, yeah. <laughs> Jacob, he makes his point without saying it. Jacob was a great guy. And he gave you this incredible well. But I'll bet you, you've been to this well before, haven't you? You have. And every time you come, you get water. And then what happens? You're thirsty again. And you come back day after day after day and year after year after year. And you're never satisfied. I want to give you water that will always satisfy you. He was describing the reality of her soul. And that is the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness needs to be refilled over and over and over. And the circumstances got to be just right. And people got to be acting just right. And it will never, ever, ever substitute for the joy that only Jesus can offer you. Jesus was physically thirsty, but she was spiritually thirsty. She was sad. Her soul was parched. In just a few verses, Jesus is going to make the point, look, you've been married five times, and the one that you're living with now, he's not even your husband. What was going on in her? Every single time she got married, she said, this is the one. This is the person who is going to satisfy my heart. And then lo and behold, he didn't. And then she tried again and again, and now she was living with someone, and it wasn't getting it for her. She's desperately seeking joy. You know, every once in a while, I will hear someone say, I have a friend, and they're not a Christian yet but they're seeking God. You ever hear someone say that? Or maybe you've said that. I have a friend, they're seeking God. And you have this person, you think, well, I really want to know the Lord. They really are striving after him, but they haven't quite caught him yet. Can I just tell you, the Bible says that there is none that seeks after God. None of us seek God. We run from God. We seek the things that God can give to us. What we want is, is this, or this, or this, and what we really want is soul satisfaction, but we don't want God because God is there to be grasped. He's always there to be grasped, the Bible tells us. And so the Bible teaches us there's a third piece of this path to joy, and that third piece is this. Joy comes by receiving living water. You're going to have an opportunity in your lifetime to receive living water. But joy only happens when you receive that and then it continues to spring up in you. The Bible says this, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, the water I'm referring to, or the water that you're referring to, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him, it's in you, a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Living water is not stagnant water. Living water means it's a stream that's flowing. A pond has stagnant water. 
Not long ago, we had a neighbor, and uh, this neighbor had a pool, and their pool uh, was only about five inches deep, okay? So can you imagine what happens in five inches of water in Fresno? Usually, mosquitoes happen. And so day after day, we were getting bit by this mosquito and that mosquito. And, and I have to be honest with you, I wasn't really getting bit. I, I don't know why they don't bite me, but I don't get bit by mosquitoes. But everybody else in the household was getting bit by these mosquitoes. And the reason, it was stagnant water. You would never drink that water. It had been sitting there months and months. Some of us, as a believer, you live your life and you got this little bit of spiritual water and it's old. It's old truths that you used to know about God that he told you a long time ago, old things that he did in your life, but nothing is new. The Holy Spirit is supposed to flow through us. You don't hold on to the Holy Spirit. He flows through you. That's the kind of living water he wants to give, but that is a gift, he says. He calls it a gift twice. It's freely given. You don't earn or ever deserve the living water that God wants to give to you. You simply ask him for it. Only living water quenches our thirst. If you went out today, it's probably a pretty hot day, and you said, I'm gonna run three miles around my block, and you ran and ran. When you come inside, you're gonna know what you need. You're gonna be thirsty, you'll have lost a lot of water, and you know you need water. You don't want milk. You don't want Diet Coke, no matter how much you like Diet Coke. You just want water. You know what you need. The problem with our soul is that we almost never know what we need. We say, where am I going to get purpose? Where am I going to get meaning? Where am I going to get significance and fulfillment? And so many times we point to a person. You are not giving me meaning and significance and purpose. You're not doing this thing or this circumstance. If this circumstance, I would be better. And all that would do is give you some temporary happiness, but it's never gonna give you joy. There's not a person in the world that's the reason that you don't have joy because only Jesus offers joy and only you can receive that joy or you can reject that joy. In fact, the Bible teaches us in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, God speaks directly to this. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. I give living water. And they have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. He says, not only did they forsake me, they came up with their own God, their own way of getting water, and it's no good. There's no water there. What ways have you been looking for happiness? That thing to try to put into your life, and it just may have given you happiness, but it has not produced joy. That's the broken cistern that God is referring to. He says, this is evil. You're replacing me with this person that you think could make you happy someday this possession this place this circumstance it's never working and it never has worked the next verse he says is this jesus says it is done i am the alpha the omega the beginning the end to the thirsty i will give from the spring of the water of life without payment he says if you're thirsty i give it you don't even pay for it I want to give it to you, and I'm the only one who can meet the need of your soul. Jesus alone can do that. In John chapter 7, verse 37, the Bible says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus declares that today. Anybody who's thirsty, come to me and drink. And in the next verse, he tells you where he's going to put this well. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, joy stays in you. When you're living a life and you're walking with God and there's not sin in your life to 
take away the joy of your salvation. You know what happens? That joy just gets better with difficult circumstances. When you really look to Jesus and nobody else, your joy is full. James chapter one, verse two says, brothers, when trials come your way, your joy is going to increase. And if it's not, it's because you relied on happiness and you were not relying on joy. Well, let's read one more verse here in this text. In, verse four, in chapter four, verse 15, the Bible says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water. I don't wanna be thirsty anymore. And I don't have to come here to this well anymore. And Jesus said to her, okay, go call your husband and come here. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, well, you're right in saying I don't have a, a husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. Of course, when she hears this, she's like, okay, well, you're a prophet. You're, you're amazing. You're, you're, you're a brilliant person to be able to tell me that. But what Jesus was saying is, you're a sinner. And the way you receive this living water is you've got to admit you're a sinner. Look for just a moment who's being offered living water. It wasn't the Pharisees who said, we're in good shape, we're fine. It's a woman who's hurt, broken, struggling, looking for joy. And Jesus says, if you're willing, if you're willing to acknowledge your brokenness here, I will give you living water. She says, give it to me. I hate coming here to this well. Every time I come here to this well, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, I'm alone. And years later, there'd be a book written called The Scarlet Letter when this Hester Prynne had to put this A on her chest. It signified adultery. And she was saying, that's me. But what happened after she received the living water? Shame was gone. Immediately. She went out and told the world everything that she'd ever done and about Jesus who'd forgiven her. And her joy was complete. When you get living water from Jesus, he takes away your shame. He takes away your embarrassment. You don't have anything to be ashamed of because you know that God Almighty accepts you just as you are. And there's nothing you need to do to gain his approval because he's already loved you. Are you relying today on happiness to try to eke out a good day? Or is there joy welling up in you? It's possible that you're a believer today and you've lost the joy of your salvation. There's only one reason we lose the joy of our salvation and it's our own sin. You say, oh yeah, but this person over here, they sinned against me. They can't cause you to lose your joy. Only you can break that relationship with you and Jesus and the living water stops and the joy stops. The Holy Spirit stops flowing in your life. And all the things you're doing, it just seems to wreck everything you, everywhere you go. But if you're willing to acknowledge your sin as the one with the well did and say, you know what? I need you to forgive me. I need you to cleanse me. You can come back and leave those broken cisterns that you built for yourself. Those broken places where you say, well, I was trying to get joy over here and over here and over here. And just say, Jesus, I'm relying on you alone for my joy. Maybe you've never come to Jesus for the very first time. Maybe there's never been a time in your life you've said, you know what, I am a sinner and I need you to forgive my sins. Someone has once compared when you receive Jesus to getting hit by an 18-wheeler. Basically, when you get hit by an 18-wheeler, you know it. It's a powerful experience. I had a friend that was hit by an 18-wheeler on his bike, and he lived to tell about it. In fact, he rode the same bike a year later, 100 miles. It's a memorable experience. Have you had that experience with Jesus where he has changed your life, given you living water, forgiven your sins? If you'd say, Will, I'm not sure, but I want to know for sure today that he has had he's had got my heart and he's my savior i'm going to ask you to pray a simple prayer with me and if these words represent your desire to know christ as your savior why don't you pray them along with me in your heart to the lord 
you might simply say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And right now, I put my trust in you alone to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for your forgiveness of sin. Thank you for giving me a new home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If today you prayed that prayer and you meant that with all of your heart, we would love to rejoice with you in that. We wanna help you grow in your walk with Jesus. You can let us know that you made that decision today by texting 559-435-2200 and text the word believe to that number. And that number is on your screen right now. When you text the word believe to us, we're gonna get back to you with a, a gift that we wanna give to you of a Bible, as well as some instructions on how you can continue to grow and put some people into your life to help you grow in your walk with Jesus. Maybe you'd say, well, I'm a Christian and I've built these other cisterns and I just need to pray with somebody. Uh, you can text the word prayer also to that number and we will give you a call and pray with you and we would love to do that also. Or you can call the number on the screen and we'll pray with you. I wanna pray one more time. I wanna pray for those of us who are listening to my voice right now who'd say, well, I don't have joy. My happiness is gone. It was there, but it comes and goes and I want joy again. I wanna pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, for all those who are praying with me in this moment, I ask that you would uh, show them the broken cistern in their life, the place that they were going to try to get joy. And I pray that they would confess that to you as sin. And they would run to you. And as soon as they embrace you and trust you for that joy, you'd give that to them in a way they've never experienced in the past. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today, and we'd like to end our service with a time of worship. Will you join me in worshiping with our worship team? Let's take this time to really make that declaration of what the decision that you've just made. The song is called I Believe. I believe.